I'm going to use one of these. Uh, hi, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. Uh, it's, it's very good to be here. Sorry if anyone has any trouble with the English accent. Uh, it was a birth defect. Uh, and uh, I don't have any slides to show you today. I just thought I'd kind of talk to you a little bit about some of the things that have been annoying me uh, for the last few years. And really, uh, oh, I should say, by, by the way, uh, I came in here, I was, I was greeted very, very kindly, and then Michael told me that I could speak for as long as I wanted. <laughs> this is an unusual thing for me. So, buckle uh, up. Um, so yeah, I, I want to talk about a couple of things, really, and, and they're kind of questions that have been niggling me as I, I kind of work in the media industry. Uh, and one of them is, why is it that when journalists write the kind of things that do better with metrics, do they feel worse about their jobs? Uh, and the second thing is, why the hell aren't we in a golden age for journalism? Those are the kind of two questions that niggle away at me. And I'm going to try and kick off with that first one there, because it's, it's this interesting thing. If you're in a newsroom, and uh, I've been in an awful lot of newsrooms, and people say, well, you know what? I have a choice. I can write the thing that the metrics dictate will do well, or I can write the thing that the mission dictates will do well. And for lots of people, it's this real, real challenge where they feel torn. And by the way, this isn't just something that happens in journalism. This kind of conflict between metrics and mission happens in a lot of industries. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, US hospitals were looking for a way to be more data-driven. They, uh, they want to try and choose the metric, the metric that went by which they could judge performance. And they chose, um, wow, well, they chose mortality rate. What better way to understand how well your hospital is doing than to understand how many people are dying? Trouble was that the single fastest way to improve your mortality rate is to stop admitting the sickest patients. It's to stop doing the experimental surgery. It's to stop taking some of the risks that a hospital should. Instead, people just did the safe thing. And we see the same thing in, uh, in journalism, where we feel like, you know what, we have to write for these metrics, we have to uh, do that, and sometimes the mission just gets lost. And maybe, just maybe, it's because, you know what, maybe our audience just isn't that smart. I hear this a lot, well, you know what, I've got to write for the masses, uh, and they aren't as nuanced as I am, or as thoughtful, or they don't care as much about world events as I do, and, and that's just not true. So we looked at, uh, was it, we took 2,000 sites. We took 580,000 articles from those 2,000 sites. We looked at 2 billion page views that happened across those 580,000 articles. And we took out all the things that were most clicked on, all the terms and topics that were most clicked on. We didn't stop there. We then separated them into the topics that were most, most clicked on and read, and the topics that were most clicked on and least read. And my God, it restores your faith in humanity. In the most clicked on and least read, you had top, richest, biggest, fictional companies and uh, Virginia, for some reason. That's, that's data for you. Um, and in the most clicked on and most read, you had Obamacare, Syria, Zimmerman, Woody Allen. You know, people, when you stop just caring about their index things and start thinking about what their minds actually like, people are actually pretty smart. They're actually interested in real topics. But we've been told that just to write for the for the clip, for the page view. But isn't this isn't this how we make all our money though? Isn't this why we're in a golden age for journalism? Because my God, shouldn't we? We should be in a golden age for journalism. I mean, if you took an industry and you said this industry has had a market growth in terms of reach and penetration of 14 to 15x in the last 20 years. It's found new and amazing ways to interact with its, uh, with its audience, and no shortage of quality, there's no shortage of pulitzers around it. If you, if you said that about any other industry, they would assume it to be a golden age. But we're not. Why? Because we don't actually monetize content at all. 
We learn it. We monetize the links to content. Once you've clicked on that page, once the page load has happened, then whether someone reads the article or not, whether they like it or loathe it, makes no difference. So this is what's put us into this really strange world, where we are in a world of effectively infinite inventory. There's infinite potential uh, for clicks. And in a world of infinite inventory, prices always trend towards zero. And this is why we can have all the marks of the golden age, but still have the New York Times have to sell its own building. I mean, this is, this is crazy. And the other, it's not just the publishers that are getting screwed by this, it's the users too. Because when we say that actually your job is just to create as many clicks as possible to get that page load, and who cares what happens after us, then the most economically rational strategy is to create a really provocative headline that links to nothing other than another really provocative headline, and then another really provocative headline. Any investment in quality, in research, and thoughtfulness, that is a departure from the rational economic strategy. And the users pay for that. They pay for that in clickbait, in slideshows, in crap. So the users are feeling pretty screwed by this world. But hey, advertisers are doing pretty well, yeah? I mean, if prices are trending towards zero, that's got to be amazing for advertisers. They should be really, really happy. But they also feel like they're getting screwed, and it's worth taking a moment here to think about how unusual this is. In media, we live in a three-sided market of advertisers, media companies, and users, all of whom feel like they're getting screwed. Because for brands, what they want, if you're a brand advertiser, if you're not someone who just cares about picture, if you're Miller Lite, and by the way, when Miller Lite puts an ad up on the web, they're not expecting you to click through and buy a six-pack. Tiffany's, when they put their ads in the New York Times, is not expecting you to buy an engagement ring by clicking on that ad. They want to put a compelling message in front of you and they want to capture your time and attention. That's what they care about. And so, right now though, brands can't tell beyond the click-through rate, which they don't care about, what works and what doesn't. As one of them put it to me, he said, it's like I've got a, two billboards. One billboard is by the side of a really busy road. Got tons of people going past it. The other billboard is in the middle of a forest. I can't tell which is which. Because it's just on page limits. It's not on attention. And so, we started to think about this. And not just people at Charlie, people all, all around the world have been thinking about this and said, like, okay, what would happen if we tried to solve the problem for these advertisers, for the people who make all this possible? If what they want is people's time and attention, what would happen if we just solved them there? And here's where it gets interesting, because time is the only unit of scarcity on the web. Mark Zuckerberg can add a box to Facebook and he's added a billion new impressions to the web. He cannot add a 25th hour to someone's day. Also, time is zero sum. If I'm spending five minutes on BuzzFeed, I'm not spending five minutes on time.com. And it also nicely correlates with quality. Because here's the thing, and this is the thing that people forget about, and as journalists, you should really take much more pride in this. A visitor's default behavior is not to read everything you've ever written. A visitor's default behavior at any particular moment in time is to leave. That is their default. So when you can hold someone's attention, even for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, what you're doing is you're competing against the entire sum of human knowledge in every form of media entertainment ever created. I mean, that's amazing. You should take a moment and just go, wow, I did that. That's competition. So, 
What this suggests is that if you could move to an economy where time is, not, is what matters, where users' attention is what matters, not just the loading of a page, then maybe you would be able to get to that place of an economy of scarcity with premium prices and potentially a sustainable business model for quality on the web. That was the dream. So why hasn't it happened thus far? And in part, it's the fault of people like me. And by that I mean technologists working in the media space. Because when you look at how we've been measuring time thus far, it's kind of pretty shitty. So, uh, do people know how we traditionally measure time on the web? This is how we do it. You take it, someone comes to a website, comes at 12 o'clock, we take a timestamp of that page load. We then hope like hell that they go on to another page, take another timestamp, and count between the two. How many people here on their browsers have more than one tab open at any one moment in time? How many people here have ever left their browser open and gone off to get a coffee? Yeah, you're a journalist, no shit. Uh, <laughs> how many people here just haven't like gone onto another page on the same site? I can tell you, by the way, the data suggests most of you. Uh, for all these reasons, time on site has been this incredibly inaccurate thing, and you get these wonderful moments. There was a CRO of a, uh, of a large East Coast publisher, uh, not represented here, I should say, um, who on a panel was talking about the, the wonder of his native advertising. He's like, you know what, there was this story that got like six or seven minutes of time. And I was like, I saw that story. The story was 700 words long. Average reading speed is 250 to 300 words a minute. That means that you're telling me that your audience is approximately three times slower than a normal person. <laughs> is that going in your sales decks? Um, so there were problems with time. But now what's been happening recently, and it's been happening across a bunch of different technology companies, is we've been looking to try and find new ways of measuring this. And now, we've got down to a point where we can tell whether you're looking at the page or not. We can tell exactly what part of it and for exactly how long. So Bill comes to a page, starts reading the first few paragraphs, then gets distracted because someone asks him if he wants a drink, he says no, comes back, reads another 40 pixels or so, then bails. We can tell that now. So we have the ability to start to measure on time. And now that we have the technology, it's becoming a very, very interesting place. Two months ago, the Financial Times announced that they would move not just from selling on a CPM basis, so not just the page loads and impressions, but the amount of time with their audience. Saying, how much time can we get? How many hours do you want with the top CEOs in Europe? That's their new sales pitch. And by the way, it's working very, very well. And this is starting to spread. The uh, Online Publishers Association, now called Digital Content Net, which represents most of the top publishers in the US, they surveyed their teams and they found that 80% of their constituents were either exploring or moving towards selling based on time. So this is happening. And this is what gives me hope for the future. This is what makes me think that maybe we can have a golden age of journalism after all. <coughs> because if we can move to a web where it is not just someone's index finger, but how much attention you can capture from them that matters, how good your writing is, in that web where we can make brands happy, we can give publishers a sustainable business model for quality, and for users, when users get a web which is designed to hold their attention, then every eye bleedingly bad design, every slideshow, everything like that, which is designed to make you click, is now bad for business. Instead, sites have to be beautiful. They have to make you want to stay for as long as possible. And that, to me, is a web worth fighting for. That's all I got. <laughs>